Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Tesserado channel. This is the place for all things steampunk, that wonderful genre of science fiction that mixes sci-fi inventivity with history. Now last week we talked about what does it mean to be human, specifically in the context of that classic movie Blade Runner and the Philip K. Dick book that spawned it. This week we're going to talk about the other aspect. What does it mean to create life? I deliberately posed that question in kind of an edgy fashion uh, to get you thinking because really it does involve taking a godlike role to create a machines, automata, robots, if you will, that can think. And uh, this has been a kind of a dream of human beings uh, in legends and myth throughout human history. If you can think of the concept that we are unlike the other animals. I mean, as soon as people realized that, they started to, to write creation stories. And if this being called God, or a God, could, could produce us, could give us a soul and a mind and so on, uh, why couldn't we do the same? <laughs> and so it's been a lot of stories throughout legends. You think about the Sorcerer's Apprentice, where they animate a uh, non-animate entity to, to, to do their bidding, or the idea of the golem, which is a, an alchemist will take this, uh, take this mud or earth, fashion it into like a man, and recite these magical incantations and it comes to life and does their bidding. In both cases, notice the similarity, in both cases the um, creation can often turn on its creator, <laughs> sometimes in grisly ways. So it's a bit of a cautionary tale. Nonetheless, it wasn't until the 1800s and the Industrial Revolution that people started to take the idea seriously. I mean, all this technology was miraculous. This was the first time that we were like freed from a lot of the constraints of nature. Uh, we could have machines that did our, did our work that weren't alive uh, take the place of horses and oxen and, and other load-bearing animals, uh, and the steam engine and, and locomotives and so on. And so if we could do that, and if we could have machinery that did some of the work of a person, you know, why not replace a person entirely? <laughs> <laughs> for whatever the implications of that are. And so that got a lot of people thinking. And in 1818, a young woman uh, named Mary Shelley wrote this book called Frankenstein. <laughs> and uh, it got things rolling. I mean, obviously everybody in the world has heard of it. And it was written 205 years ago this year. And it spawned a whole series of books and movies and so on, not just in its own right, but with other stories about people creating other human-like entities, including the uh, farcical stories like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> but be that as it, as it may, uh, the theme of mechanical men was taken so seriously that inventors tried to invent them. Now, it was a difficult proposition, especially back then when power supplies were not easy to come by. I mean, battery technology was in its infancy. Uh, clockwork, springs and so on, was kind of limited. And so you had steam power, which was very bulky and kind of dangerous. Nonetheless, in 1868, uh, two men, Zadok P. Diedrich, love that name, and Isaac Grass of New Newark, New Jersey, they patented this steam man. They built him and they said he's going to be able to pull wagons with the strength of three horses. Now why they made him with two legs instead of four, I don't know, but in any case it didn't work out for them. It was not successful, but it did get um, some writers going, in particular Edward S. Ellis, who wrote this series called The Steam Man of the Prairies. And this was kind of a YA series of adventure novels about this young genius named Johnny Brainerd, which is a great name, appropriate name, who invents this steam man 
who can pull a cart and allows him to go adventuring across the Wild West. And, when, and, and because of the, he has this steam man to pull him, he can brave the, the harsh elements, he can uh, battle outlaws and hostile Indians and all these things. And it was great fun. Of course, these days, people scream racist because he's battling Indians. Well, it was something that happened at the time, and you've got to say that. So, besides the idea of mechanical men, they also, other writers, came up with the idea of mechanical women, <laughs> and particularly from a male point of view. Uh, so, ex so, example, The Sandman, by a Ger German author named Hoffman, in this case, there's this mechanical doll, and she's like, she looks just like a woman, except she's perfect. <laughs> she's perfect in every way. And uh, this, this student, who's the protagonist, falls in love with her, not knowing that she's not a real human. And this also happens in The Future Eve by a French guy, Auguste Villiers de Lilladome. <laughs> How do you say that? Uh, and in this case, Thomas Edison creates, creates her, this uh, mechanical woman, and he calls her an android. First, first popular use of that term uh, from andros for man, the Greek word. And, of course, we had the mechanical walkers in H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds and uh, the Tin Man in, in Wizard of Oz, 1900. <laughs> but the word robot was not known until 1920 when the Czech playwright Carol Chapek wrote a, wrote a uh, play called Are You Are? Rossum's Universal Robots, in which the robots, <clears throat> the created, created uh, beings, rebel against their creators. And the robot, the word robot here comes from robota, a Czech word meaning forced labor. So, after that, robots became a staple of a lot of fiction, both uh, impressionistic and serious sci-fi, fantasy and so forth, too many to name. <laughs> I could go for hours talking about this, but I won't. And indeed, a person could have a whole channel about robots in science fiction because there are so many. The Wikipedia page lists hundreds of them. Although some are kind of trivial. They don't, I mean, they list the important ones like C-3PO and R2-D2, of course, but a lot of ridiculously silly ones that like might have one might have appeared in one one episode of a comedy, but I'm only going to talk about steampunk because robots were an important idea in Victorian fiction. We steampunk writers have to write about it, and it's an important component. Funny thing is that I have read it's approaching 150 steampunk novels now, and surprisingly enough, only about a tenth of them. Are there actually robots as a plot element or a significant element in the story? Which you would think there'd be more, but, you know, I guess, you know, goggles and airships and steam engines are a little bit more important, a little higher up on the scale, but still, uh, the idea, the fanciful idea of a, uh, of a robot servant or whatever, it's a very Victorian notion, and it, and it really plays well in sci-fi. Of course, robots take on a lot of other roles in these books, and I'm going to mention a few of them. First of all, it's the antagonist, which can it can be kind of a mindless menace, or it can be a crafty, evil, nefarious uh, enemy that thinks for itself. Gail Carriger's Solus, for example, which is a really fun series about vampires and werewolves in Victorian London, it still it still does have the airships and so on. And in the first book, the protagonist has to battle this uh, evil android who was sent to kill her. Another place where we see a robot menace is China Nievel's Perdido Street Station, which takes place in this fantasy world, really bizarre world where there's all these other creatures, like there's cactus people, there's bug people, and so on. <laughs> but there's also this great junkyard where they throw out all their stuff, and these machines kind of agglomerate to become this giant robot creature with all these tentacles everywhere that's, that's like this mysterious menace. It very much mirrors an idea from cyberpunk of a, of a computer coming to life. 
Bonsert Bockel. Um, he's a guy who has a who has a uh, YouTube station, YouTube channel called uh, Radio Retro Future, and has written uh, Wrench in the Machine, which I recently reviewed. Fun book, a lot of fun. And there are the cyborg villains in this story, and there are a lot of people that have these fancy mechanical limbs, very robot-like. Important component in the story. Whitechapel Gods by S.M. Peters. There are these robot crime lords called Mama Engine and Grandfather Clock. <laughs> uh, so sometimes the robot is meant to be a servant or helper, but it turns on the master just like the golem often does. Uh, Sherry Priest's Tanglefoot, a short story about a robot boy that runs amok. Uh, K.W. Jeter, 1987 book, Infernal Devices. Now, he's the fellow who can coin the term steampunk. The protagonist is this sh schmuck called called George Dower, whose father was a genius, but he's got no talent. <laughs> his father has died. He can't take his place but uh, or fill his shoes at all, but it so happens that there's this machine that's much like him, that looks just like him. To his dismay, he finds out that this this machine has been seducing women all over the place, which George Dower finds really appalling because he's very, very much of a prig. <laughs> but it's funny. It's, it's fun and it's funny. Sometimes a robot is not specifically antagonist, but is an important part of the story. Uh, a, a tool that's used by the characters to advance their own aims. And, and a good example of this is David Lee Summers' a Clockwork Century series. And he's a fellow Southwestern. I've met him at various conventions. A very nice guy. His books are called Owl Dance and Lightning Wolves. They're set in the in the West, in the American West, in the 1800s. And these various event, this inventor has invented these mechanical creatures that help him do various things, research the wild, and so on, spy on people. It's 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 a very fun series. In my own book. Fidelio's Automata, I have to toot my own horn, a Cuban inventor, Fidelio Espinosa, invents this mechanical spider whose purpose is to automate uh, dangerous tasks and save human lives. But somebody steals the idea and puts it to nefarious use. So moving on, we also have humor. <laughs> Robots can provide humor. In Phil and Kaya Foglio's series, Girl Genius, which is primarily a graphic novel, though there are prose versions as well. The titular Girl Genius, Agatha Heterodyne, likes to create robots. Tiny robots she calls clanks. And they run around and do, do all sorts of things. And so it's kind of fun, kind of funny, but also menacing, because this giant clank comes and kidnaps her at, in, at one point. My own book, written together with the wonderful Mrs. Desperado, called uh, Professor Ion D and the Epicurean Incident, we have a robot who is also comic relief. It involves a cooking contest in which one of the chefs has a robotic assistant. He's a Scotsman, he's too cheap to hire a human, and so he creates this robot, which he's always yelling at, you stupid bucket of bolts, that sort of thing. Finally, and perhaps most interestingly, robots can be the protagonist of the story. And most notably, there's a, a Russian-American writer called Ekaterina Cedia, and she's very talented, a bit of a feminist, but nonetheless, her books are good regardless, because <laughs> I'm not big on this, these political messages here. But her book, The Alchemy of Stone, the, the central character is a robot. She's a clockwork girl. And she has a mind of her own if she wants to live her own life and be on her own. And uh, her creator relents and lets her do this. She has knowledge of alchemy, so she works as a healer for us fallible human beings. But interestingly, uh, the creator does not completely let her go. He has the only key to her mainspring, which is not an innuendo. <laughs> And literally, she's powered by a mainspring, and if he doesn't periodically wind her, she will run down. So she's still dependent upon him, which she hates. Uh, another place with a with a robotic 
protagonist is Cibola's Promise by Aaron Lawston. Another southwestern story. It takes place in the Arizona Territory. And uh, there's these clockwork dolls. And one of these dolls is one of the protagonists. It was made by this uh, professor who sells patent medicine. And they kind of entertain the audience and help sell his, his scam miracle cure. It's kind of funny to think that he can invent these wonderful dolls and yet he still has to make money off of patent medicine. But of course, the doll wants to be free and, and he's not going to let her. So, that's, that's, here's the conflict in that story. Finally, and I have to mention this one because it's really weird and you like stuff that's weird, <laughs> this will appeal to you. Clockwork Planet uh, by uh, a couple of Japanese fellows, Yui Kamiya and Tsubaki Himana. This was a light novel. Uh, made into an anime, which is which is quite strange. <laughs> I reviewed it a long time ago in a, in my blog when I was when that was active, and it's it's got interesting elements, but it's got weirdness to it too that I didn't quite like. But some people might find it interesting. The Earth has been destroyed and repla replaced by a clockwork replica. No kidding. And the, the hero is a young boy who is very talented at clock repair. And he meets this robot. <laughs> she's a female robot. She's very cute. She's very adorable. But she's also very dangerous. She can, she can, has these knives built into her body that she can kill people with. And, and of course, this boy is in love with her. <laughs> and there's a lot of really inappropriate humor in this one, so I wouldn't recommend it to kids, but it is, it is, kind, of, it is kind of fun and an amusing kind of uh, accident, you know, car accident type of way. <laughs> and I love most anime, but this one is just kind of funky and weird. So that kind of rounds up my list of steampunk novels that I have read that have robots as a central theme or character or whatever. And I hope you've enjoyed it. I, and uh, I hope you've, I hope you will check out some of these books if you haven't done so already, especially my own. <laughs> because why not? Uh, why not blow my own horn? And so thank you for joining me on this steampunk adventure. And please like and subscribe. It helps us get out the good steampunk word. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.